Blog Talk Radio. Good evening and welcome to House Talk with Dr. Lauren Pitts. I am your host, Dr. Lauren Pitts. Our guest co-host this month, Dr. Gregory Williams, has a Ph.D. in counseling and is a well-known speaker and teacher. Dr. Williams, you know I absolutely love having you on House Talk. You know, this has just been an awesome month, Dr. Pitts. I, I am just so excited, and to be honest with you, tonight I'm in the wonderful, uh, on the strip, in the New York, New York Casino Hotel in Las Vegas, and I mm-hmm. have paused for an hour tonight just to be with you two ladies to share the importance of what we're going to talk about tonight. It's an honor to be here. Awesome. Listeners, don't forget to get Dr. Williams' new book, Shattered by the Darkness, Putting the Pieces Back Together After Child Abuse. Shattered by the Darkness is absolutely a must-read. I wholeheartedly recommend sharing it with adult family members and friends. Also joining us tonight is Sarita Gary Washington. Sarita is a faculty member at the University of Hawaii, a human trafficking activist and educator. Prior to her move to Oahu, Hawaii, she served as an active member of the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking. Sarita, it's my honor to welcome you to House Talk. Uh, It is my honor to be here, especially to talk about such a timely and important issue. So thank you so much for having me. I'm really hoping that we're able to save a life tonight with this discussion, even if we just talk about how to prevent these kinds of things from happening in the future. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Absolutely. It's an honor to have you here. And Dr. Pitts and uh, Professor Sarita, we're going to have just a a great time and uh, talk about this very important topic. And, you know, April being uh, the Child Abuse Prevention Month, Uh, All the listeners, you know, as you know, Dr. Pitts, and I truly believe this with all my heart, uh, champions uh, the notion that strengthening one family, one solution at a time, and she does that with so many families now, literally around the world. And that comes, uh, and with that comes her embrace of protecting uh, the importance and the well-being of our children. So tonight we're going to continue our discussion that we've been having all month long on how we can raise awareness and take those important necessary steps to protect and preserve the well-being of our youth. And we want our listeners to know uh, to get involved and to be part of the solution. Uh, please don't wait, though. If you, honestly, if you know of a child uh, who is being abused or neglected, call the police or the Child Protective Services right now. And you can call the National Child Abuse Hotline at 1-800-422-4453. And that National Abuse Child Abuse Hotline is 1-800-422-4453. And I know we have hundreds, if not thousands, of listeners listening to us tonight. Yeah. And we have an information-packed show. And Dr. Pitts, it's literally people around the world, right? Yeah, absolutely. It really, really is. Around the world tonight. Yeah. And, And of course, we want to hear from the listeners, so that's what's going to be fun. The listeners get to call in. They get to comment, make uh, ask questions, so we're looking uh, to hear from them tonight, too. And to join in on this important conversation or just to ask a question, call us live at 515 605 Nine seven four four five one five six zero five nine seven four four. Let's jump in with both feet tonight. Our subject is preventing child sexual abuse and human trafficking. Dr. Pitts. Sarita, let me just tell you first. I literally bombarded social media today, um, every hour on the hour from seven o'clock this morning up until seven o'clock tonight sharing stats on child sexual abuse and on human trafficking. So if you could, please share with our listeners, what is child sexual abuse and what role is it playing in the human trafficking of our youth? 
I'm so glad you brought that up because one of the distinctions I think it's important for us to make, first of all, is what uh, human trafficking is. So many people have such kind of different uh, opinions or ideas about it. Um, oftentimes, first of all, they may conflate labor trafficking with sex, sex trafficking, which are two different things, and we can talk a little bit more about that if you have a mm-hmm. follow-up question in that area. But mm-hmm, also mm-hmm. when we think about just under the category of sex trafficking, we often think of someone who is um, a prostitute. Prostitution mm-hmm. and sex trafficking are not the same thing. Um, wow. As a matter of fact, we don't even realize that term anymore. So um, a grown woman who is not being controlled by someone else and who's making a conscious choice to be a sex worker is a different mm-hmm. thing. Um, a okay. child who is 16 years old, even if she tells you she willingly decided to work for a pimp, she is not a prostitute. She would be considered someone who's being sexually exploited. And so wow. she would be, the term is that she is a commercially sexually exploited child. And mm-hmm. for too long, what we've done is we've criminalized the victims in these circumstances. We've arrested mm-hmm. the child who's been caught up in the situation, usually because of a number of risk factors, which I'll be getting into a little bit later as well. Um, okay. But, yeah, first of all, we just kind of have to understand what sex trafficking actually is. And, mm-hmm. again, a victim of sex trafficking can be found working in massage parlors, Bravo strip clubs, escort services. Many times, more than 50% of the victims are estimated to be under the age of 18. And so, wow. By U.S. law, by U.S. law, any person under 18 involved in the commercial sex industry is considered a human trafficking victim, even if she does not see herself that way. Wow. 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 Well, uh, professor, how I, – I know about uh, child sexual abuse. I, I experienced it for, for years in my own personal life, and I know Dr. Pitts has mm-hmm. too. But yeah. how do – the children get caught up in human trafficking. This educate me on this a little bit more. I, I don't know much about yeah. the human trafficking side. How does the children get caught up in it in the first place? That is the twenty-four thousand dollar question, especially because we tend to think of sex trafficking as an international issue. We don't think mm-hmm. that it could actually be happening in our backyard when a lot of statistics show that it is more common right in our backyards. I actually was part of a team that went out um, educating local motels about missing girls, and we were able to locate three of the girls on the missing poster sign uh, just by going out to the motel. And this was in New Jersey. So um, we have other cases. For example, in Marietta, Georgia, a man attempted to, quote, unquote, purchase a Guatemalan child for a year of sexual service. And in Miami, they found a girl who was 13 years old dancing in a club and being sold for sexual services. And so we know that this is way more common, unfortunately, than we might think. So how does one get caught up in that in the first place? Well, um, there are a number of risk factors. The average age of the trafficking victim is 12 years old. So think about your mindset at 12, right? Let's go back to 12. What is 12? Well, the average oh age. Now, first of all, let's take the word average. Average means that what? There's some people younger, right? Yeah. Is that the average? Right. That's the mean. So we wow. have to understand that in that mindset at 12, 13, 14, how would you, what psychologically um, are most adolescents going through? Well, psychology says that we're going through a search for identity. You know, Eric Erickson says it's identity versus role confusion. We want to know who we are trying to separate ourselves from our parents or caregivers. Well, the traffickers know that. And so they search for vulnerable populations. They search for undocumented um, people who are, you know, trying to stay out of um, harm's way with the government. They search for runaway and homeless youth. They search for a foster youth. They search for um, oppressed and marginalized groups. But there have been cases, and I'll tell you about one of them right now in particular, where mm-hmm. the young lady just walked out of her house. She wasn't she wasn't actively looking to be recruited by anyone. So specifically, one young lady, she's 18 years old, she was in New York City, and 
she talked about how she was kidnapped at age nine and sold oh my into God. sexual slavery and forced to sleep in a closet. And you know how he met her? He met her while she was walking down the street. He gave her his phone number. He said he was a talent scout. Now think about this. This is mm-hmm. New York City where everybody wants to be a model or an actor for this or that. He said he was a talent scout. And then later on, he gave her a whole bunch of alcohol and marijuana. Uh, when she tried to leave, he threatened her. He said he had people on the street who could find her wherever she went. And so she felt trapped in that circumstance. And notice the use of drugs and alcohol in that situation and how it was used as a tool of oppression. Because when we think about wow. it, if I can get you hooked on something, and usually it's stronger than marijuana, usually it's something like right. getting you hooked on cocaine or, or heroin or something like that, meth. Right. Now, all of a sudden, you're hooked on a substance that you're probably taking to numb the pain. But right. when I see you on the street, do I see you as someone who's a victim or someone who I need to, to interact with to save or to try to assist in a circumstance? Or do I see you as, you know, think of any pejorative term that we have for someone who's addicted to drugs. We don't even talk kindly about people who are dealing with substance abuse. If someone's you know, right. on crack, what do we call them? We call them a crackhead. Well, right. the kids know this. They know that. And they know that one way that I will look at you as less of a human being is if I get you, if he gets you addicted to some sort of substance. And then wow. we're not likely to see that you're in pain. Wow. Okay, now, now, Professor, can I, I – I from I live in Houston, and from what I'm understanding with uh, the information that's coming out on this, obviously Houston is on the, the top ten list of cities mm-hmm. that are being affected and have the most human trafficking in the nation. It's in the city of Houston. Here I am visiting at a conference – on sexual abuse right now in Vegas. Yeah. I would imagine Vegas is a huge uh, mm-hmm. market for human trafficking. What kind of uh, um, impact does the smaller towns feel of human trafficking that may be happening in places that we're not even aware of? Can, do you have any kind of information or kind of insight on where is this all being uh, affected by in our country, uh, yeah. in the big towns yeah. and yeah. the small towns? Mm-hmm. So where does it happen, right? How does someone, and I keep using, um, first of all, let me say, I keep saying she when I refer to someone who perhaps gets caught up in the circumstance, but we need to know that males can be sex trafficked too. So I want to mm-hmm. put that yeah. out there. And oftentimes those boys that are caught up in these circumstances are forced to provide um, gay sex acts, and they might not even mm. identify as gay or bisexual themselves. Mm-hmm. Sometimes mm-hmm. these are males who've gone away from home who came out to family and friends as being gay and then were kind of kicked out of the house and then forced to couch surf, if you would. That's when you go from one place, mm-hmm. you know, one, one home to another, hanging out with their friends, looking for a place to stay. Uh, some tales have told that, you know, in one male circumstance, he said, eventually, the person I was staying with said, you have to start doing your, your part around here and paying this rent, and you know what you need to be doing to do that. And then next thing oh, you know, wow. he's caught up in this circumstance as well. So it's not right. just girls that this happens to. But where yeah. does it take place? Well, just yeah. recently, right here in Hawaii, unfortunately, a massage parlor was just busted. Just I just saw it on the news this morning, as a matter of fact, before wow. I came into work today. And so we know that it can happen in places like a massage parlor. But Mm -hmm. most recently we're finding that it's happening on the Internet. Now, thank goodness, uh, Craigslist kind of took note of this. So it used to Mm -hmm. be back in the day on Craigslist, you could go off to the side if you weren't looking to, like, you know, get a free sofa or something like that. There were other Mm -hmm. categories that had to do with, like, personal connections. Well, Mm -hmm. Tim found out that that was a way – to market their goods, if you would. And when that was brought to the attention of the people who run that site, they actually got rid of those categories. You can no longer look for dating or hookup matches uh, Mm -hmm. easily on Craigslist. That category is gone. Now, there was also a page that the FBI worked really hard to get rid of, Backpage.com. Again, Mm -hmm. they found other ways to do it, the Internet. 
is one way that they've been kind of marketing, um, if you would, the the victims and, and survivors of sex trafficking. And so we know that it can often appear as something that uh, someone is presenting that they're doing of their own free will. And mm-hmm. um, we have to understand that, first of all, again, as I said, no one under the age of 18, no matter what she says, is doing it of her own free will. But also there are women and men who are over the age of 18 who are psychologically and physically caught up in these circumstances and may not be posting these ads themselves and um, may be forced into um, this kind of industry. I wanted are, to the, uh, are the people... Go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, interestingly enough, um, when I met Sarita a couple of years ago, it was because I was sort of, um, I was in the process of planning a women's conference, and one of the things that I wanted to have addressed at the women's conference was sexual abuse and human trafficking. And what I found mm-hmm. out in talking with um Sarita's counterparts at the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking is that Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware are hot for human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And a major part Mm -hmm. of that is because we have a lot of shore points here. So particularly when the weather warms up, we see the problem of human trafficking right here in the tri-state area escalating. And there have been instances just within the past year where we have had individuals that were trolling our malls, if you will, um, where there was an incident literally just eight miles from me where um, one of our strip shopping centers, there was a van spotted, and, and this particular van had been hitting, it was, with, it was trolling within a 20-mile radius. Um, and and following folks in the parking lot, and somebody, thank goodness, was even in the the traumatic experience, was able to get the tag number of the van. Um, There was another incident that I heard about that was up on the New Jersey Turnpike, where um, a woman that was traveling alone with her children had stopped at a rest stop, and it was a group of guys. It's a mess. Like, it is more prevalent right here in small town America than people realize. It, it makes me think about how my mom talks all the time about the big city this and the big city that. And, and you mm-hmm. know, it, in, in her elder years, she thinks that everything is happening in the big city. And I'm saying, Mom, what better place to get engaged in some of these antisocial and dangerous behaviors but right here in small town America where people think that nobody's paying attention? It, I mean, yeah. the... the the drugs, the, the, the poverty, you know, it, this territory that we live in, this region right here in the Northeast Corridor is hot for sex trafficking. We are only two and, and a half hours from New York City. We're a rock throw up or down the turnpike, and people don't realize it's like just because you're in small town America does not mean that it is okay to allow your sons or your daughters to be walking the street all hours of the day and night thinking that somebody's not going to snatch them because they will. Well, and yeah. notice Dude. that the example I gave, the young lady was just walking down the street and he gave her yeah. a phone number. So the pimps often look for ways and entre- an entree point, a way to begin the discussion. Yep. Another case mm-hmm. I can tell you about, a young lady was having an argument with her mom in the house, and she was going through one of those you'll never understand me kind of adolescent moments. Well, she okay. ran outside. She's standing at the bus stop crying. The guy pulls up in his car. He gets out. He, you know, comforts her. He says, of mm-hmm. course, your mother doesn't understand you. She doesn't get that you're a woman now. You know, let oh, me and kind of take care of you. And so this girl is thinking, mm-hmm. wow, this guy has a car. He's an older man. He's being mm-hmm. considerate mm-hmm. and caring and sweet. And so she goes with him. Well, he wow. ended up um, taking her that day. She He brought her home to the other girls eventually, and he said, hey, show her the ropes, make sure she knows what she's supposed to be doing, and make sure she knows the consequences if she, um, you know, decides to try to run. And so, of course, then, there's a whole psychology around trafficking. There's a yeah. really interesting documentary where pimps were interviewed, and they were asked, how do you, how do you capture people? Like, how do you get someone to buy into this? And so mm-hmm. he said, I look for people who are um, broken and abused. Wow. Yeah. Usually they have some sort of 
um, you know, daddy issues. Usually they're having uh-huh. some sort of issue where they mm-hmm. feel like the adults in their lives don't understand them. Usually mm-hmm. they might have a history of sexual abuse themselves. These pimps have a certain idea of how to get the most vulnerable, psychologically vulnerable people, and they don't start out. Um, think about the cycle of, of violence in a romantic relationship. They don't yeah. start out presenting themselves as the worst villain. Instead, and again, put yourself in the mindset of, of an adolescent. He takes mm-hmm. you to get your nails mm-hmm. done. Who doesn't want that? And that's expensive these days, you know? He takes you right. to get your hair done. He tells you how beautiful you are. Um, in one circumstance, the guy actually coordinated a situation where he could rescue the girl from some people. So he set it up to have his friend um, jump the girl and attempt to rape her. He intervenes, wow. which happened in Baltimore. He intervenes wow. and basically chases the guys off. The girl feels rescued by him and therefore oh psychologically beholden to him. And then he pulls her right into his trap. Think how elaborate that is. I mean, there's something wow. inherently evil about going to those extremes to try yes. to get someone. And that's exactly what he did. Wow, wow, wow. So the protector ends up becoming the... <laughs> The villain, the abuser, uh, in their in their mindset, she thinks he's a protector. Now, does just yes. uh, to chase a or rabbit around another bush? Her, yeah, I was going to say, or he might, she might think that he is her. Um, she's in a romantic relationship with him. So I can tell you of another case where this is exactly what happened with the young lady. She was dating. She thought she was dating this guy. She's hanging out with him. Eventually, he mm-hmm. says. Babe, you know, I don't have enough money for the rent. I don't know what to do. And he says, well, you know, you're my woman, aren't you? And she goes, yeah. And you would do anything to help take care of us, right? Yeah. Okay, well, my friend said he would pay you the money if you would do X, Y, and Z that I'm not going to say here on the radio. And wow. so then, of course, she was shocked. Like, well, I won't do that. And he said, wow, you're doing it with me for free. Why not let the guy pay you so we can pay the rent? Oh, my God. Do you see the psychology? Do you see that spider web that yeah. web that he yeah. needs to kind of, you know, and again, in psychology, we call that the four walls technique that they use in Sam, yeah. asking you a series of closed-ended questions that you're going to be forced to say yes to to create yeah. psychological pressure so that then you feel like you have to do it. And be mindful. She's underage. You know, our frontal lobe can develop until we're 25. So she doesn't yeah. have the judgment, the ability to see through what he's saying. She's just thinking right. he's right. He said I'm his woman. This is what I need to do, whatever it takes to keep us together. I need to go ahead and do this. Wow. With, wow. with what we're seeing and hearing on the news uh, every day about yeah. uh, our country being just uh, infiltrated with legal – Aliens and illegal aliens uh, just crossing the border in, in droves. Are are they being abused in in a massive way also by people that are watching on our side of the border, trapping them, convincing them, manipulating them, and then if they do have papers, stealing those papers and holding them captive, mm-hmm. And you have to give us two years of service before we give those papers back to you. Is there any kind of numbers or is that any kind of effect in what's happening in our country too, Professor? Professor Washington? Oh, yes. I'm so glad that you mentioned that um, because we do find with immigration that that creates uh, a large uh, risk factor for individuals because we find and it's risky not just in terms of um, sex trafficking but also labor trafficking. Um, so yeah. what the person who has the control does is they threaten to turn the person over to the police basically unless you do what I told you to do. Or they make you think that you have some sort of um, debt that you have to pay off, which you can never pay off because what happens is then they begin to charge you for so-called room and board, and so you never get around to paying off what you think you're trying to pay off. Um, And so what we find is that those people who are immigrating, especially if they're in a situation where they're not able to do it legally, um, but even with legal immigration, and I will tell you about a specific case 
where oftentimes these victims can be someone who's working in the home as um, a maid or a babysitter. Usually with labor trafficking, they're forced to work 10 to 16 hours a day for little or no pay. There was a case of an older woman working for 50 cents a day in a mansion in New York uh, State, and the mansion was so big they had a helicopter landing pad, and they were keeping this woman locked in a closet and paying her 50 cents a day. So oftentimes these victims are hard to see because they're immigrants who are living in the employer's home. Now, they may come over on a visa. I knew someone who did that, came over on a student visa, and what the person decided to do, what the family members decided to do, was take the visa from the student, take away her um, lock up her identification, um, force her into servitude, allowed her to take one or two classes because in order to keep the student visa, you have to be a student at least part time. And so, but didn't allow her to participate in anything else. And then they proceeded to um, physically assault her every single day to the point to where she was suicidal. And this happened right you know, in the tri-state area with someone. And so they were able to do this because they had her documentation. And she wasn't the only woman in the home where that was happening. She was under the age of 20, but there was another woman over the age of 30 who was in the exact same situation because they let her visa expire. And so then she was um, considered a quote-unquote illegal alien and felt like she had no repercussions. There was nothing that she could do about this. Um, When it's family, there's uh, just a complexity that exists uh, that's difficult because oftentimes the person who's being trafficked feels like if they tell, they're going to be perceived as ungrateful or causing problems in the family. And in the circumstance that I'm talking about, the perpetrator threatened the family members back home and said, if you try to tell, this is what I'm going to do to your people back home. And the threat even included putting a curse on someone at home. And so if you believe in that, you feel right. ashamed, you feel fearful, you feel like you're the one who's the problem. Other psychological tactics they, inc- they used included um, blaming the person and saying, hey, listen, if you tell, that means your cousins will go into foster care if we get locked up and that will be all your fault. Do you see that? The fear factor. And so someone doesn't want to think it's all their fault. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So when we look at what's going on in terms of um, human trafficking and sex uh, slavery and sex trafficking, we understand that, um, you know, immigration does play a large a large role in making someone vulnerable because they feel like they cannot, they don't have any legal recourse at all. And then add that to not speaking the language. And so then yeah. who are you really going to tell, right? Right. Wow. Is, is the okay. same fear and the same numbers or maybe the same uh, attacks happening on our American citizens that are traveling to other countries uh, and being kidnapped, like on spring break or things of that order. Are there documented cases that that's a number that is being affected and rising? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, internationally, we've had some com- some countries have to come together and kind of sign an accord as to what they were going to do about this issue. Because what we found was that um, there are certain certain countries where this is more likely to occur than other countries. And so mm-hmm. just recently, the United Nations had released its uh, report on human trafficking globally. And what we found is that most countries have now passed legislation that criminalizes trafficking in, per- in individuals as, a, as a, an offense. Now, previously, that wasn't something that someone could be arrested for, but they passed some legislation. What we did find is countries like Romania, it's a source of transit and it's a destination for some people. And what we found is that um, you're much more likely to have victims who are from Romania end up in a labor or sex trafficking circumstance, but also certain areas of um, Bangladesh, the Philippines, Serbia. And so we have to make sure when we're traveling um, that we keep our wits about us, especially if we're studying abroad. You know, if you're a college student studying abroad, Mm -hmm. you go to um, another country, just making sure that um, you're aware of your circumstances at all times, that you're not going out to clubs, putting your drink down and not paying attention to what could be, mm-hmm. you know, tossed into your drink, not being so yeah. trusting 
And remember I said social media is uh, something that's utilized to try to get jobs, if you would, for these um, Mm -hmm. victims of human trafficking. But it's also a way that they're getting the trafficked victims. So when you're swiping left and right and you're putting so much of yourself out on social media, we put our location. Somebody can see, hey, Serena just checked in at the Cheesecake Factory. Okay, so now everybody knows I'm there. Well, what happens when you're, you know, kind of out of the country and someone's tracking you? And we don't think that anyone is likely to be looking at us so intensely, but those individuals who are in this criminal line of um, work actually are looking at you. They're looking for ways to get in and they're looking for ways to catch you being vulnerable. Wow. 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 This you know, you're listening. A- I want to break in here right now because we've gone 30 minutes here. And, you know, I just want yeah. everybody to know they're listening to House Talk with uh, the awesome Dr. Horn Pitts. And <laughs> listeners, we do want to hear from you because this information is so powerful. And you may know of somebody uh, in your family or be infected or you're afraid they're, they're involved in this or trapped in this. If you want to make a comment or ask a question, please call us right now at 515-605-9744. 515-605-9744. Back to you, Dr. Pitts. So, Dr. Williams, I'll ask you first because, oh, my goodness, the egregious sexual abuse in your childhood that led you to write Shattered by the Darkness you know, what What are some of the warning signs of possible sexual abuse that our listeners can, can be aware of, can be made aware of? Well, yeah, now, really kind of changing gears, and I know it's still within the same uh, vein of what we're talking about tonight, but uh, I, I, I think any type of um, complete change, radical change in behavior mm-hmm. – uh, mm-hmm. If you have a, a child that's in your home and all of a sudden, they, you know, they, they were happy-go-lucky and mm-hmm. uh, all of a sudden there's an anger issue that is completely mm-hmm. opposite or there is something happening with them with a re- withdrawal issue or there's a mm-hmm. rage issue, um, mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I think um, if they have pets and all of a sudden they're they're starting to – be cruel to their pets and that's out of their normal behavior. Um, Mm -hmm. I think even in this situation with the the trafficking, if they're being uh, maybe in the situation where they're still at home and being abused in that controlled in that area, I think any kind of um, over obedience to somebody Mm -hmm. that, you know, oh, I have to call him right now, or I have to okay. call Uncle Bob at 6:30, uh, or okay. something. And you notice that there's a control issue that they they won't let go of. And I know here, okay. Professor, in a minute, I want to I want you to throw in some too that could maybe be more with uh, the trafficking part. But I think um, any type of inappropriate sexual behavior, exposing mm-hmm. private parts, uh, acting mm-hmm. out sexually. Uh, mm-hmm with their brothers uh, or their younger sister or brother. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, nightmares. Uh, Nightmares are things that still affect me. Bedwetting is a big one. Uh, If it wasn't an issue before and all of a Mm -hmm. sudden it's an issue now, Mm -hmm. uh, I think if they refer and go into sucking, that's a major uh, I think red flag. Don't don't get all mm-hmm. excited if they start doing that. But if it's out of the norm and you're noticing mm-hmm. it, um, if they just black can't sleep, sleeping mm-hmm. they don't want to mm-hmm. sleep, or that's all they want to do is mm-hmm. sleep. Mm-hmm. Eating disorders. Yeah. I think um, if they automatically start losing weight or automatically mm-hmm. start eating everything in sight, again. Mm-hmm something that is uh, abrupt change in their normal behavior. And then here's where school is a big issue. If they were a straight A student and all of a sudden they're flunking yes. courses, all yes. of a sudden yes. there is a major change in yes. that type of homework uh, being mm-hmm. turned into things of that order. That's mm-hmm. a ding, ding, ding alarm 
for parents yeah. to say, wait, something is happening to them. I'm not saying sexual abuse all the time, but I'm thinking mm-hmm. also bullying, also yes, a yes. traumatic event, also yes. something going on in their lives of that child that should raise our attention and our eyebrows yes. of going, something is happening to this child that I need mm-hmm. to sit down with them and start looking mm-hmm. And investigating Mm -hmm. and become sensitive to their world and Mm -hmm. uh, push some of the other things aside and start focusing Mm -hmm. on on our child but obviously that's the behavior signals but there's physical Mm -hmm. signals and Mm -hmm. I I don't know how my my mom didn't see these and if she did why didn't she notice it but yeah uh, trouble trouble setting trouble Mm -hmm. walking Scars wow. of open scars around their mouth. Uh, I had that frequently as a child because of what my father was doing with his body parts. Uh, mm-hmm. It was uh, obviously tearing of the inside of my mouth, uh, even up into the bruising of the upper palate in a, in a small mm-hmm. child's mouth uh, is, is something to be aware of. Any type of redness. Uh, I was speaking uh, the other day. Uh, at mm-hmm. a conference with Texas teachers uh, mm-hmm. in northern Texas. And mm-hmm. uh, one of the teachers raised their hand. They said, you know, when I'm uh, changing the baby's diaper, uh, they're screaming now when I'm wiping uh, the child's uh, butt. Is that something I should be alarmed about? And it was like, uh, really? Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. If they're, if they're screaming that it's sore. It's not normal diaper rash. It's something more. Yeah. Yes. Now don't call DCFS, but be aware of it. Go to the and we need to open our eyes. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Open our eyes to what's going on. I had open scars on the inside of my legs for months, and my mom mm-hmm. never noticed that. My PE right. teacher in school, when we used to have to have open showers, when I was uh, mm-hmm. never noticed that. Right. Uh, or your pediatrician. They should have. When we talk about Absolutely. family physicians being involved, there's actually one family physician at a Native American <laughs> health center in Oakland, California, who actually has a, a question. She asks, have you ever traded sex for money to try to identify victims oh. of commercial exploitation? Just that right. boldly um, you know, when the child is old enough to answer. But we find mm-hmm. that nearly 88% of trafficking survivors reported having some kind of contact with the healthcare system mm-hmm. while they were trafficked. So we wow. know wow. that the healthcare system plays a critical role in helping us to identify and be able to assist in these problems. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a mother who, of three sons who were being trafficked from uh, Togo. And this mm-hmm. was labor trafficking. Well, a dentist who treated the boys recognized their paperwork didn't match their ages and medical history. So mm-hmm. just being able to piece that together, looking at how yeah. the records and what was being reported uh, didn't match. Yeah. Or if you are giving a medical appointment and there's some adult that seems to be hovering around and not willing to leave you alone with the, with the patient. So we do yeah. know that the, the medical um, field, at, they definitely play a significant role in helping mm-hmm. to identify. And just to talk about some of the other things that parents and other people should be aware of, specifically when it comes to sex trafficking, is if your child comes home with a tattoo that they didn't have before. And some oh. tattoos are like a brand to a pimp. So it's his, or his um, actual, um, I don't know, mm-hmm. trademark. So if it says mm-hmm. daddy's girl, daddy's princess, money maker, there's one uh, common one that bottom B. Um, if your oh, wow. child all of, all of a sudden begins dressing inappropriately for their age, wearing clothes that are too mm-hmm. sexy, too low cut, um, if we know, for example, that your child all of a sudden has somebody that they're dating who appears to be way older than them, if they're um, being very secretive about, you know, hiding the, the identity of new friends. Um, if you find crumpled up lingerie stashed under the bed, um, if you find business cards from strip clubs or escort agencies or all of a sudden your, your daughter has or son has an agent from a casting agency, look into that. Um, new clothing that you didn't buy in the wardrobe. Well, where did you get that from? This is where we need to start asking questions. Um you know, Professor, I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm an older older man now, uh, and I have grandchildren, but I want to let you know as a parent, 
Mm-hmm. If any of my children came home with a tattoo, I would not be understanding. I would not have a friendly conversation with them. <laughs> I would have a come to Jesus conversation, yeah. and we're going to say we're getting to the bottom of this right now. Yeah. And for parents, yeah. Yeah. so I, I, I'm now getting grandchildren that are in that uh, five, six uh, years old age. Even as a grandparent, I'm going to do the same thing. They got pierced mm-hmm. where? Right, right. We need yeah. to have a talk. Yeah. What's wrong with I the parents so. of us not being aware and saying, yeah. oh, we just can't yeah. go there and yeah. have that conversation. Mm-hmm. Hello, yeah. we need to have the conversation. Yeah. Right. Well, I want to throw something in there real quick. About and then then his private privacy. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to throw the two things in there real quick, and then we have a caller. Um, I, oh, I just good. wanted to see the, uh, uh, another red flag I think we need to pay attention to is if a child becomes unusually clingy, more so than what they've Mm -hmm. previously been, and if they perhaps were not afraid of the dark and now they're deathly afraid of the dark. I think that's something that folks need to pay attention to. So let me let this caller in. But specific specific to sex trafficking, we also have to know, Mm -hmm. for example, Mm -hmm. if your child all of a sudden has a lot of hotel keys, why are they walking around with hotel keys? Or if they right. seem to know language wow. about sexual activities and sex acts mm-hmm. that's not typical for their age. So there are some signs that can be specific to sex trafficking um, okay. in addition to sexual abuse. Wow. There's an anger getting built up in me just listening to this about yeah. this could be happening to people I know. I hope everybody's feeling yeah. the same emotions inside them. Yeah. Go ahead. We have a caller, uh, Dr. Pitts. Yeah. Caller 5962. You are on the air. Welcome to House Talk. What is your question or comment? Hello, Dr. Pitts. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you, sir? I'm I'm very well. Uh, first and foremost, um, Dr. Pitts, Dr. Williams, uh, Professor Williams, um, I I am so uh, excited about the show. I'm a faithful listener, so I want to get that, that out there first and foremost. I love what you guys are doing. Uh, my question is, um, you know, when our kids were small, basically we gave them the stranger danger type of thing um, to look out for. What can we do in addition to help and and safeguard our kids before these things happen? Well, stranger danger is something that is only prevalent in about 7% of Hmm. the sexual child abuse right now. So it's 93% of everything else is people that the child and people the child is aware of that they know right. the people and then yeah. what is it, something like 60 some percent is are actually people in their same household yeah uh, so the stranger danger story is a great story don't take candy from uh, a person that's wearing a long trench coat in the park but that's yeah. not that's not even double digits in the percentage of where our children are being abused they're being abused yeah. by people that in their own house. they know. Yeah. So now we have to have the strong conversation. I'll throw my piece out and let you all jump in. The stronger mm-hmm. conversation of sitting your child down and going, this is the part of your body that mm-hmm. no one should ever touch. And if you have a swimsuit and you can put it on and they're touching any part that is covered with that swimsuit, you mm-hmm. don't let them touch that. Even your doctor on certain cases mm-hmm. alone, and, and you let them know. And then have the conversation of we're not going to talk about uh, body parts and, and use cutesy little names. We're going to use what the real name is of that body part. Yeah. It, it's not, you know, this and, and call it a wee-wee or something. It is right. and use the name. The, the, right. the medical term of what that name is. Kids can handle this today. And we really need to have that real conversation. And then I'm, one more, and I'm going to uh, let somebody else talk. But I think of one that I heard the other day that is awesome. Always have a code word with your yes. child. A code word. It could be uh, – Blue, it could be uh, cloudy, or it it could be any word that you come up with, but you tell your child, if you come and tell me that word, I am going to intervene immediately, and don't let anybody else know that word but us and you. 
and yeah. secrets are good to have, but secrets need to be broken when yes. it's causing you hurt or pain. Now, I'm going to kind of hush up and let you all talk, but th- that's that's the ones that I think need to be thrown out there. But go ahead, uh, Professor or Dr. Pitts. Professor Washington, I'll let you go first. All right. Thank you so much. And again, thanks so much for uh, such an important question. And so we do know that um, specifically with human trafficking and what um, do- what doctor said was really important, that we use the biological names of body parts because when we're mm-hmm. interacting with healthcare professionals and you say somebody did something to your cookie, you know, then we're thinking you mean an actual cookie. So you right. need to be um, mindful that we're using the, the terms as they're supposed to be used. We also have to keep in mind that um, for the victim of sex trafficking, that person may feel a psychological bond with their trafficker, like Stockholm Syndrome. So oftentimes right. these people, oh. again, there's a, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, and that has to do with kind of understanding the kinds of things that we need in order to feel like we're a healthy, whole human being, well, the perpetrator uses that against us. So he says that we need physiological things. We need to feel um, that we're being taken care of. We need to feel safety. Well, the the abuser begins to take those things away from you and make you rely on him for those things. And so what happens is that the trafficker has a psychological hold over the person. And so when we find someone in that circumstance, you might think that they would be, you know, experience um, emotions of gratitude or convey to you how happy they are that you got them out of the circumstance, but that may not be the case at all. As a matter of fact, mm-hmm. a lot of times when we're interacting with someone who's caught it, you know, in the circumstance, you're mm-hmm. angry that you are messing up their relationship, that you're trying to control their yeah. lives, that you are, you know, intervening. And so we have to kind of understand that it may not it be even um, – in their mind, it may not seem like a positive uh, intervention at, in the moment. Professor, uh, let me interrupt if I, if I may. In that psychological uh, control of a child's mind or a teenager's mind, mm-hmm. I, I had mm-hmm. that with my own life. And I know Dr. Pitts, probably in your abuse, you did too. I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm thinking from times we've had uh, conversations that my yeah. dad would say, you know, you, you, will need to do this. If you tell anybody about this, mm-hmm. this is going to happen uh, yeah. to your brothers. Nobody's going to believe you. You're going to get in yeah. trouble. How would, you know, and it will be ridiculed and things of that. Order. So they get inside your head and they mm-hmm. start manipulating. So the kids literally get uh, brainwashed uh, by the abuser or the perpetrator or the you controller or the trafficker. Yeah. 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 I mean, when you think about attachment theory, we just want to feel that contact, comfort, and that love. And so what they do is they look for ways to kind of fill in that gap in this false way, which is why they look for people who might be looking for love, who might be looking to feel that human connection. We're social creatures, and we want to feel understood. And so they look for ways to make you feel like that's what they're doing when really they're trying to take advantage of you. And so, yeah, the psychology of it, understanding that is really important. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pitts, uh, you jump in and and answer a couple with what the caller asked. You know what? I'm, I I think that the the caller's question is a great segue because we are running short on time. We have roughly 12 minutes left. Yeah. We have roughly 12 minutes left, so um, caller, I hope this helped. We are actually getting ready to segue into um, some preventative measures that 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 you all can take. So we'll 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 throw some more out there before the conclusion of the show um, about how to prevent child sexual abuse and human trafficking. Um, but thank you for calling House Talk. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Mm-hmm. Doctor Williams, back to you. Yes, uh, lady. So let's just go ahead and segue big time. Uh, what can we do, uh, and our listeners do, to since this is uh, April uh, Prevent Child Sexual Abuse Month, what can we do to prevent child sexual abuse? And then, uh, Professor, what can we do to help prevent human trafficking? A huge problem 
that's growing leaps and bounds. And this, the child sexual abuse, folks, is growing leaps and bounds, too. What was it, a couple of days ago, the Boy Scouts came out with another number that was in the thousands, and they may release the names of the perpetrators. They may release the names. They may. Why right. not release every one of them? Come on now. What's no. wrong with okay. us? Okay, I'll hush up. <laughs> How can yeah. we prevent uh, <laughs> sec- so, uh, yeah. child sexual abuse and human trafficking? Give us some, some so, ideas. So preventing the, the child sexual abuse, I think that it's really important that, that parents take an active role in their children's lives. I mean, you have to yeah. learn about your kids' activities and the people that they're involved with and dealing with. And stay alert for possible problems. Stop. And I'm not saying everybody does this, but the reality of it is we know some people do. You're passing your kid off to this one and that one and the other one because either you don't feel like being bothered, you're working like crazy, you're running the street or whatever the case may be, and you're not even fully aware of of who your child is around and what they're doing. Um, the, The other thing that I would say is ensure that the organizations, groups, and and teams that your children are involved with are are really limiting the one-on-one time that's spent between the children and the adults. And ask how staff and volunteers are screened and supervised. Some of these folks are slipping through the cracks, and they're having all types of access to our kids. And then after the fact, we find out that they had a criminal record or that they were on the sex offenders registry. And it's because people weren't doing their due diligence and checking them out in the first place. Good point. Well, and I'll, I'll bring up more when we do the key points in a couple of minutes. But go ahead, Professor Washington. <laughs> All right. Um, really, what I have are kind of like um, I want to say my three B's, if you will. B mm-hmm. as in boy. So the mm-hmm. first one is be newsy. Be newsy. It's okay. There's this. I don't know what it is in our society today, but children get all this right to privacy stuff. You should be able to establish that if your child has a cell phone that you're paying for, you have access to that whenever you feel like it. And at any time. You need to text at their any time. Text messages, if you need to, yeah. you know, uh, kind of look into what's going on in their social media, if they're hanging out, we, you know, there's a kind of parenting style called the neglectful parenting style. And it's not neglectful as in an abusive kind of thing. It's neglectful because these parents are so wrapped up in their own lives, they don't mm-hmm. know what's going on in their children's lives. So do you know the name of your child's best friend? Do you know, yeah. um, you know, what's going on in school? When you ask a teenager, how was your day in school today, what are they going to say? What's the answer? The answer is usually fine, right? Well, is that yeah. <laughs> Does that really tell you how was their day in school today? Right. And so we have to switch up our conversation. We have to be newsy. We have to say, okay, I know you had a chemistry test today. What happened in Mm -hmm. chemistry? Or I know you and Melissa were fighting the other day. You guys were arguing. Did you guys resolve that? You should know the people in your child's life and be able to to talk, have real conversations with them. Um, The other B, the second B I want to say is be nonjudgmental. So again, mm. oh, even good. when I was being raised, when I was being raised, we all had in our communities the little girl that our parents called fast or loose. You can't play with mm-hmm. her. She's too fast. Well, now mm-hmm. think about how judgmental that is. And if she's right. fast and she's nine, that's a problem, isn't it? Yeah. That means that little girl yeah. needs oh, some boy. supervision, some guidance, and some love, yeah. not judgment, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. why are we so quick to, you know, label someone as a drug addict, a crackhead, a this, somebody yeah. who's a, you know, a spot? The young people say that hoe over there. Really? Yeah. So now we come <laughs> up with slang that permits it, right? Why are we using yeah. slang that permits it instead of, instead of saying, she's my sister and she might need help? So right. how about being non-judgmental? So that's my second B. Mm-hmm. My third B mm-hmm. is be a good listener. And that is so hard yes. because oftentimes we're so quick, especially as adults who are knowledgeable and, and wise, mm-hmm. we wanted to carry up and kind of sermonize, or especially mm-hmm. me, I'm a professessor, I always want to lecture. I'm and guilty. Not all the time that <laughs> I'm guilty. A lecture isn't needed yeah. all the time. Um, yeah, yeah. It's listening to what's not being said. You might be having a conversation with your child. Your child never talks about the date that she just went on last night. Why didn't she talk about her date? Why didn't she tell you what happened? You know, so being a good listener involves not just listening to what your child is saying, but also what your child is not 
telling you, what your child is not yeah. saying, so that you, yeah. know, you can know the right way to answer the question. So those are my three Bs. Be newsy, wow. yes, be in your child's business, be nonjudgmental, and be a good mm-hmm. listener. Dr. Williams, wow. we have another wow. caller. I'm going to try and get them in really oh, quick. Great. Caller 7331, you're on the air. Welcome to House Talk. What is your comment or question? Welcome, caller. Well, I, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. So for me, I think that her B's were really important, but what I really thought her B would go to is be a parent first and foremost. I'm a mother of three children, two girls and one boy. And I don't care if you're a male, if you're a female, you need to be present. You need to know who your children's friends are. You need to show up when they don't expect you to show up. Yeah. And don't apologize for it. (laughs) Do not apologize for it. Be the house that every child wants to stop at, stay at, visit, eat your food, and guess what? If they eat it all, so what? You still got your kids, and they're healthy, and they're happy, and they're safe. I know where my kids are at night. I know who their friends are. And you know what? I even know which one of their friends were pregnant before their parents knew they they were pregnant. Because I am involved, and I don't apologize for being a parent, not today, not tomorrow, not ever. Not when they're 18, not when they're 21, not when they're 35. They're mine. Wow. Wow. You're making Next week's guest host will be you. you this, if you said, <laughs> if, if you said that up now, the way that you just described it, Thank you. then you don't Thank have to worry so about much. that when your child gets older. It's really wonderful that you stated it that way. So, for example, my daughter, whenever she, and she, my daughter is 23. Whenever she's getting into um, an Uber or, or shared ride and it's late at night, she makes yeah. sure that I have her location. The location is turned on. And it's because yes. we've had that talk to where you can try to be, you know, grown if you want to and be running around and nobody knows where you are, or you can be safe. Which one yeah. do you want to be? I don't want to be the one having to answer questions to the police about where, you're, yes. where you were last, and I have no idea. So yeah, how do you think about ways to just be safe? and. That's really important in light of what just happened with a young girl, right? She got into a ride that she thought was an mm-hmm. Uber. It was yeah. not an Uber. It was a guy pretending to be an Uber, and he ended up wow. taking her life. So we have to, oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that, being, you know, being newly judgment, non-judgmental and being a good listener is all part of being a good parent, and you're right about that. Wow. Absolutely. Hey, I, I tell you what, I, I know we're, we're running almost up to the wire. Uh, what a great discussion tonight. Thank you, callers, for calling in. Uh, Dr. Pitts, I'm just going to let you take it and just run uh, the rest of the way with it tonight because I know you need to close this out. But thank you so much, uh, Professor and uh, Dr. Pitts and all the callers. So, Dr. Pitts, uh, close us out, if you would, with some key Call takeaways. and. Uh, I will do. Uh, caller, thank you for joining us on House Talk tonight. And please do call in again. <laughs> awesome. Um, so... Some of our listeners may already be faced with this issue, and they're grappling with what to do to to help their children. Um, so, one of the things that I want to touch on before we close out in these last you know couple of minutes is making sure that parents understand um, that there is help available throughout the community to help your children deal with the trauma of sexual abuse and or human trafficking. Um, and certainly you can reach out to us. But that information, I mean, you can Google it for your area. Um, you can, you know, check your, your local human service or uh, social services office. Even your um, children's school guidance office should be able to have um, links for you. But certainly we'd be willing to share them with you. Um, I think, you know, Dr. Williams, it's been such a rich conversation tonight. I think in actuality, we already touched on some keys. We touched on them throughout. Yes. So what I'll do is I'll pull from what we've already shared um, and post them as the key takeaways for the show. So I, I just want to leave our listeners with this final thought. To prevent your child from falling victim to sexual abuse or human trafficking, it's important to keep the focus on adult responsibility while teaching children skills to help them protect themselves. The trauma caused by sexual abuse and human trafficking can have a lasting effect on your child. And if it's not addressed, it can lead to trouble in school, as Dr. Williams stated, relationships, or even lead lead to drug and alcohol use and abuse. And and the most tragic outcome, unfortunately, could be death. Um, 
please don't ignore the warning signs that we've shared with you tonight. As I said earlier, I posted a wealth of statistical information on all of our social media platforms. So the statistics are upfront, personal, and smack dab in your face. Um, please know that help is available for you and your family. I want to thank you for tuning in tonight. And don't forget to join us next week as we kick off the month of May, focused on topics relevant to women. Also, we're going to take an in-depth look at how these varying topics are impacting the lives of black women specifically. Professor Washington is actually going to be rejoining yeah. us again in the month of May, and I'm sure we'll see Dr. Williams <laughs> back sooner rather than later. I want to thank you both for May such I give an the amazing... For the national hotline? Yes, 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 yes. The national hotline. Yes, the national... You want to get it? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes, that would be awesome. The national hotline for human trafficking is 888-373-7825. Again, that's 888-373-7888, or you could text the word BE FREE, B -E -F -R -E -E, that's 233733, and uh, help will be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if you or someone you know needs assistance. Oh, the, Professor Washington, thank you for pulling me up on that. And I and I apologize to the listeners. I had the National Child Abuse Hotline number in there, and I it never even I, I apologize for that. Thank you so much for sharing that with our listeners. Um, very, very, very important information. I want to thank you both from the bottom of my heart for joining me tonight for an amazing, an amazing, amazing show here on House Talk with Dr. Lauren Pitts. To all of our listeners, tune in next week for more powerful discussions and solution-focused strategies that you can apply to your lives. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, y'all. Good night. Thank you. Mm -hmm.